Well, good morning again. Pleasure to be with you. And today we're going to be continuing a sermon series uh, that we started last week through the season of Lent is our plan entitled, What Does It Mean to Stand in a Falling World? We've recognized as believers that the world around us is changing. And it's changing in what seems to be with increasing speed. And many of the trajectories of change in the world around us are concerning. They're alarming. And so as Christians, we feel a need, a calling to stand and to stand for Christ in the world around us, which is changing so rapidly. And so what we hope to be exploring starting last week and through the season of Lent is what are we to be standing for, and also in what manner are we to stand as we are witnesses to Jesus Christ and His gospel. Last week we looked at what it means to stand for truth in a falling world, and we said as Christians, particularly we stand for the gospel and the truth of the fallenness of the world, the truth of the reality of sin and rebellion against a holy God, and for the truth of the forgiveness and mercy and grace of Jesus Christ, that because of His finished work on the cross, we now have access to reconciliation with our Creator, and because of the Holy Spirit, we stand for the truth of the newness of life that we have in Him. And today we'll be discussing another topic that is concerning in the trajectory that our culture has taken and what it means for us to stand for Christ in the midst of it, and that is the topic of beauty. And our reading today comes from the Psalms, Psalm 27, and we'll be looking at verses 4 and verse 8, those two verses together. So I invite you to stand as we read from the Word of God together. One thing I ask from the Lord, this only do I seek, that I may dwell in the house of the Lord all the days of my life, to gaze on the beauty of the Lord and to seek Him in His temple. My heart says of you, seek His face. Your face, Lord, will I seek. Though the grass withers and the flower fades, the word of our Lord remains forever. Please be seated. And again, we pray with grateful hearts, Holy Spirit, for the gift to us of your holy word. We thank you, Holy Spirit, for you inspiring your servants to give us these your words to us. We pray, Holy Spirit, just as you inspired and were with the authors of Holy Scripture, that you would be with us, that you would be with us in our hearts and our souls to comfort us where we need to be comforted that you would challenge and confront where we are in our sin. And Lord, that you would transform and change ourselves into an increasing likeness of Jesus. We cannot do this of ourselves. The spirit is willing, but the flesh is weak. But in Christ, all things are possible. We pray in his name, amen. So just as last week as we were exploring the concept of truth, we want to begin with some definitions. But just as we said last week with truth, truth is a very large topic. And last week we spent some time kind of grazing the surface of it and talking about what it means to stand for truth, but by no means is that covering all of what could be said about it. Same thing for beauty today. Beauty is a very large topic. And today we'll be talking about it from a biblical perspective, but by no means does that mean that what we'll be saying today is the last word, final word, or all is to be said about it. But we begin by asking some questions, what is beauty? In the Webster Dictionary, beauty is defined this way. Beauty is the quality or aggregate of qualities in a person or a thing that gives pleasure to the senses or pleasurably exalts the mind or spirit. In other words, pleasure, I mean, sorry, beauty here is not simply what you see with your eyes, although that would be beautiful, 
but we can also imagine beautiful music, beautiful poetry, beautiful language. Another definition, this is I'm thinking from an individual, Howard Gardner, he says, beauty is something that's interesting. That's different. It has a memorable form and invites revisiting, and as a bonus, it gives you a tingle. So I'm not sure what constitutes beauty now, but a little bit different there, right? Uh, here's another definition. These are just kind of random. Uh, here's one that talks about attractiveness as beauty, something that's attractive. Uh, here's one that talks about beauty as being something that's effective, maybe a beautiful design or gratifying or telling. And here's one that says beauty is happiness. We can see that beauty is difficult to define. And of course, one of the most famous sayings about beauty is that beauty is in the eye of the beholder. But is that the last word to say about it? Is beauty purely subjective? Now, of course, it is subjective. I was watching a National Geographic where they were talking about how different cultures uh, approach courtship and dating and leading towards marriage, and there are cultures, in this case in Africa, where in order to uh, have a woman appear beautiful, um, they keep a young woman in the dark, and I mean, it was Africa, maybe it was someplace else, I don't know if it was Africa, but it was some other place. And they keep the, a woman in the dark, and they feed her lots of potatoes. Because for a woman to be attractive in that culture, it would be someone that has lighter skin, fair skin, pale, and would be not skinny. That's like the opposite of how our culture in the United States, at least somewhat, understands attractiveness is tan-skinned and skinnier. So in other words, is, you know, beauty is somewhat in the eye of the beholder for sure, but is that all to be said about it? And we want to suggest today, no, that there is an objective ground for beauty in the person of God. But we also want to recognize, as we said, we were talking about standing in a falling world, that there are certain trajectories in relationship to beauty in our culture which are concerning and are damaging. So we want to compare and contrast a beauty that leads towards emptiness, towards a beauty that leads towards fullness. And as believers in Jesus, we want to recognize when something is leading people astray towards emptiness and to stand for the beauty that leads to the fullness of life. So we'll start by exploring what does it mean to say that there's a beauty that leads to emptiness. Now what we'll be talking about, at least in the, right now, I want to give a little bit of a proviso. This is not just women. Now, but a lot of what we're talking about t happens to tend to apply to women because a lot of data when it talks about beauty focuses on women, but by no means is it limited to men, women. Men as well, okay? Uh, so men, include yourself in these things. Uh, just as a woman can be obsessed with outward appearance, men can be obsessed with six-packs and being at the gym and being fancy clothes too. So it's not, not just women, although some of what we'll talk about tends to look like it's just women. But to give some facts about the trajectories in our culture, when it comes to cosmetics, the cosmetic industry worldwide currently, or at least within the last couple of years, uh, amounts to $532 billion worldwide. It's a lot. It's a lot. But giving, we're talking about trends and where things are heading. Now, giving trends, they estimate by the year 2025, that will have augmented from 532 billion to 800 billion by 2025 just shy of a trillion dollars in the cosmetic industry. Now, am I insinuating by that that women are sinning if they put on lipstick? I'm not saying that. We're talking about an obsession that leads towards emptiness. So if we talk about even that um, 532 billion current number for cosmetics, where are the majority of those cosmetics sold? In the United States. But I want to focus a little bit more on not so much cosmetics, but surgeries, where people are going under the knife to alter their appearance. Let me show you some statistics there. According to the American Society of Plastic Surgeons, almost 18 million people went, underwent surgical and minimally invasive cosmetic procedures in the United States in 2018. That's about 250,000 more than the previous year, 
and the trends are this is going to continue to rise and rise and rise. And that's what we're seeing, that more and more people are undergoing surgeries to alter their appearance, to be beautiful. And this is not just, not just women. This is men as well. I mean, I was in the gym yesterday, and there were two young men, and actually it's interesting that it disproportionately affects younger people. And we'll see why in a second. There were two younger men who were discussing with one another at the gym where they were putting the needles to hide the needle marks to inject themselves with steroids. So this is not just women. But what's going on? What are some of the contributing factors to this in our culture? And we'll see what some of the contributing factors is emptiness. In this case, it's men, but we can talk about men as well. Women who rated their self-esteem, life satisfaction, and attractiveness as low had few religious beliefs, interesting, and had high media exposure were likely to undergo cosmetic surgery. So notice some of these trends. When somebody is empty, as some of these statistics demonstrate, people are attempting to find fulfillment somewhere. They're not finding it in their appearance, so they try to alter their appearance in order to find fullness. But do they find it? Do they achieve all the fullness that they're looking for? And what's contributing to these things? We'll look at two real quickly. One, social media, and the second is celebrity culture. But social media, fueling the overall growth demand for cosmetic procedures, social media. So look at this. 72% of those surveyed reported that seeing patients who sought out cosmetic procedures, they did so in order to, quote, look better for selfies. What's going on here? Where is fulfillment found? What is true beauty? Fulfillment here is to be found because you've posted an image on social media and the number of people that like your photo or the number of people that quote and give comments on Instagram or Facebook or whatever has become the gauge by which you determine your value. I wish you determined that you're beautiful, that people like you, that you belong, and where you find fulfillment. It's also the case with celebrity culture. Celebrities have always influenced cosmetic space, according to surveys, but look at this. 84% of those surveyed agreed that celebrities, quote, had a moderate to great influence on facial plastic surgery trends. And again, this is on an increasing trajectory as we as a culture are increasingly obsessed with celebrity. Now, what plastic surgeons need to tell people is that actually when even you're looking at these photos of celebrities, they aren't even real. As Ashley Gord, as a plastic surgeon, said, I often have to remind patients that photos of the most beautiful people in the world have been photoshopped, facetuned, or filtered. But it doesn't matter, they want to look like it anyway. It's not just women. So they bring in a picture of Kim Kardashian and they say, I want to look like this. Because if I look like this, I'll find fulfillment. Angelina Jolie, Brad Pitt, Bradley Cooper, who I didn't know who that was until this week. I... <laughs> but he's a good looking guy, I get it, right? Kylie Jenner. People are obsessed with these things, and they will spend serious money to alter themselves to be beautiful and find fulfillment. And maybe Jesus would say to them what he said to the Pharisees. Everything you do is to be done for people to see. Notice what he says. You look beautiful on the outside, but on the inside, you're empty and you're dead. But you think that the outside is all that counts, but it's on the inside of what makes something beautiful. So as we see these trends in the world around us as Christians, as followers of Christ, we want to ask ourselves some important questions about our own approach to these things. But we want to dig into the Scriptures to draw from the well of the truth of the Word of God about the true nature of beauty. 
because there is a beauty that leads to fullness. We want to see that that beauty that leads to fullness has its source in the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is the source of beauty. And the presence of God is where fullness is found. As the Holy Spirit prepares a place of beauty for the habitation of God to dwell with His people. Let me say that one more time. The Holy Spirit prepares a habitation of beauty for God to come and dwell with His people. And we see this through Scripture. The first place we see beauty introduced is in the opening chapters of Genesis, which begins with the waters that are formless and void. And what is hovering over the face of those waters? The Holy Spirit. And here in Michigan, we have a beautiful front row seat to the beauties of God and creation. And in the midst of the work of the Spirit in creation, we read in Genesis chapter 2 that the Holy Spirit planted a garden whose name in Hebrew means delightful. It's called Eden. And Eden is specifically described in Genesis chapter 2 as being beautiful. And in the midst of this context of beauty, God brings His human creatures, Adam and Eve, that He may commune with them in the fullness that comes with relationship with the Creator. And yet in the midst of this beautiful place, in communion with God, in the fullness that comes in relationship with Him, Adam and Eve are tempted to strive after a beauty that leaves one empty. As they see the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, that it is beautiful and delightful. And so they take And when they take, are they left full? They are left empty. And God removes them from the context of beauty and removes them from the context of relationship where He communes and dwells with them out into the wilderness east of Eden. But God in His mercy and His grace comes to dwell with His people once again. As the Lord delivers the Israelites out from bondage in the house of slavery to Pharaoh, He brings them into the wilderness to Mount Sinai, where the presence of the Lord comes to dwell upon the mountain. And He tells Moses and He tells the people, just as I dwelled with you in the context of the Garden of Eden, I am going to come and dwell with you again. And He gives a plan to His servant Moses for a tabernacle. And should we be surprised that the tabernacle was designed to be beautiful as it is constructed with gold and silver and precious stone? But there is a detail that we might miss out on if we don't look closely, is that who is the one who is the preparer for the divine presence to come and reside there? Who prepares for the presence of God to come? the Holy Spirit. And where do we see that? In Exodus 31, we read the very first time in Scripture where it describes the Holy Spirit filling a person. And his name is Bazalel. It says there that I have chosen Bazalel, I have filled him with the Spirit. I filled him with wisdom and understanding and knowledge to work with all kinds of artistic designs in gold and silver and bronze and stones and wood and to engage in all kinds of crafts. So the question for you and I is, who is the one who prepares the beautiful place for the Spirit of God to come to dwell with His people? The Holy Spirit does. And the Shekinah glory comes to fill and God comes to dwell with His people once again, just as they were in the garden. And as we look forward through salvation history, we see the construction of the temple in Jerusalem as God says, I'm going to put my name in this place. And who do we see that's overseeing the preparation and construction of that? Two people, 
David and Solomon, who we know are filled with the Holy Spirit. So yes, there are people involved with that, but the Holy Spirit was overseeing the preparation and the construction of the place that was beautiful, that God would come and reside with his people. And we see the dedication of that in 1 Kings chapter 8 as the Shekinah glory that's so beautiful that the people cannot even stand to look at it fills that temple. As we read about in Isaiah chapter 6, I mean, those... uh, Seraphim who are cherubim who are, are, are attending to the Lord are covering their eyes, not because they're sinful, but because of the blinding glory and beauty of God. And just as it was in the Garden of Eden, Adam and Eve, so the people of Israel, they reject the Lord, do not follow his commandments, and decide they'd rather not live in communion in the midst of the beautiful place where God comes to dwell. And just as Adam and Eve were exiled out of the garden, so the people of Israel are exiled out of the land. And we read in the opening books, chapters of the book of Ezekiel that the glory of the Lord leaves the temple, and Nebuchadnezzar and the Babylonians come and destroy it. But again, the Lord in His mercies, as we read in the end of Ezekiel, chapter 40 through 48, we read about the construction of a new temple. And in chapter 43, we read about the return of the Shekinah glory. The glory would come again, and God would come to dwell with his people as he would be their God. And when the exiles come back from Babylon, and they come back to Jerusalem, we read about the Nezra and Nehemiah, and they rebuild the temple. When the foundations are laid, it says the people weep. Why are they weeping? It depends on how old you were. If you were young, you were weeping with joy at the completion of the foundations being laid. If you were old, you were weeping from a place of sorrow because it paled in comparison to the former beauty and glory of the temple built through the Holy Spirit by David and Solomon. And an interesting question to ask, does the Shekinah glory return to that temple? Is there a record in Scripture of the glory returning to the temple once it was built as they returned from Babylon? Nope. The glory does not return. Enter in our Lord Jesus. Our Lord Jesus is a temple builder. He is a greater Bazalel, empowered and filled by the Holy Spirit, a greater David, a greater Solomon to prepare and oversee the construction of a house that will be the inhabitation of the Holy Spirit. Even as we read, as Jesus comes up from the waters of baptism, the Holy Spirit comes and descends upon him as what Jesus does in his ministry on earth is through the power of the Holy Spirit. Fascinatingly, at the end of his life, as Jesus comes to Jerusalem for his death, he rides into Jerusalem on a donkey, being hailed as Hosanna, the son of David, what we celebrate at Palm Sunday. And he goes to the temple. Now, the temple in Jerusalem at that time was not the temple that was built by the exiles when they came back from Babylon and Ezra and Nehemiah. It was a new temple built by Herod, and it was exceedingly beautiful. Rabbis in the first century in the Babylonian Talmud say this, whoever has never seen the temple of Herod has never seen a beautiful building. It was stunning in the ancient world. And Jesus, as the temple builder, the king, comes to inspect that temple And what is his judgment? He comes into the temple courts. He sees the activity that is there, and he overturns all the tables, and he declares that you have made this house a den of robbers. He declares that this temple will be torn down, not one single storm left upon another, and he leaves. And then there's a really interesting episode. I don't know if you've known what to make of it. He comes across a fig tree. Do you remember this? He comes across a fig tree, and he notices something particular about this fig tree. This fig tree has lots of leaves. 
but no fruit. And notice what he does. He sees the fig tree by the wayside. He goes to it, and he finds nothing on it but leaves. And he says, may no fruit ever come from you again. And the fig tree withered at once. If you wonder, what is going on? Whenever you look in Scripture, you wonder what's going on, the first thing you should do is always look at the context. This immediately follows Jesus leaving the temple. And what this is saying is the fig tree is a dramatic enactment of the rejection of the temple. Because what Jesus is saying is, yes, it's beautiful, but it is empty. It's a beauty that leads towards emptiness. And I've come to bring a beauty that leads towards fullness. And so Jesus declares, yes, this temple will be torn down, but I am the temple builder, empowered by the Holy Spirit to prepare a beautiful place for the habitation of God to come to dwell with his people once again. And Jesus goes and in a substitutionary death pays the penalty for our sins. He's raised the newness of life for our justification and raised to sit at the right hand of God in power and glorification to rule over heaven and earth. And because of the sending of the Holy Spirit is the one who prepares the place of beauty. Jesus builds his temple. And for those who have ears to hear, the Ezekiel temple is being built by Jesus. A good question to ask in result of that is if Jesus is building his temple, has the Shekinah glory returned? Has the Shekinah glory returned? Has the Holy Spirit come back? Where do we read the Shekinah glory coming to fill the temple after the death and resurrection of Jesus? Pentecost. In Acts chapter 2, That's another sermon, but the elements in Acts chapter 2 match the coming of the Shekinah glory and others matches in other places in Scripture as the Holy Spirit has come to fill His temple. And guess who's the temple? You. As you read in the book of Ephesians, so then you are built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets, Jesus Christ being the cornerstone in whom the whole structure, the building, is held to join together as a holy temple in the Lord. In Him, you are being built together into a dwelling place for God by who? By the Holy Spirit, because that's what the Holy Spirit does. The Holy Spirit beautifies and prepares the place for the dwelling of the coming of God to come and be with His people, and He is doing that because of the finished work of Christ in the lives of believers as the Holy Spirit comes to dwell in each of you and in all of us together as one house. You read the same thing in the book of Corinthians. For no, other found, no one can lay a foundation other than that which is already laid, which is Jesus. Don't you know? Don't you know that you are the temple? That God's Spirit dwells in your midst. The Ezekiel temple is being built. It's a spiritual house built by God, prepared by the Holy Spirit for Him to dwell. Now, the question is, what has this got to do with us standing for beauty? What does this have to do with a culture that's obsessed with emptiness? We have the privilege of partnering with the Holy Spirit to build on the foundation of Christ and the beautification of His temple. We have the privilege of partnering with Him. We read that in 1 Corinthians directly after Paul says, you're the temple. Here's what Paul says. If anyone builds on this foundation, did you lay the foundation, by the way? Did you earn the foundation of Christ? No. This is not about works that merit salvation. This is about a building project to beautify the temple of God. If anyone builds on this foundation using gold, silver, or costly stones, precious stones, or or wood, hay, or stubble, the work will be shown for what it is, because the day will come and bring it to light, and it will be revealed with fire, and the fire will test the quality of each person's work. We are builders along with the Holy Spirit to beautify the Lord's temple built upon the foundation of Christ. The question is, what building materials are you using Just as the temple 
and constructed by the Holy Spirit through Bazalel was done with gold, silver, and precious stone. So is our temple of life built upon the foundation of Christ to be built. And the question we ask is, what's the difference between gold, silver, and precious stone and hay, wood, or stubble? Well, the text tells us when the judgment comes and we encounter fire, there will be the materials that will survive and the materials that will not. The question is, what are you building your life with? Materials that will burn up or materials that will last? And what are the materials that will last? I'm reminded of 1 Corinthians chapter 13, verse 13, which says that these three things remain. What are they? Faith, hope, and love. You want to build upon the foundation of the finished work of Christ, build with the materials of faithfulness, hope in Christ, and love for God and neighbor. Those building materials which are truly beautiful will last into eternity versus the works of the flesh and selfishness and emptiness which will be burned up. And these beautiful building materials are not about outward adornments. First Peter, we read this, your beauty should not come from outward adornments, such as elaborate hairstyles and wearing of gold jewelry or fine clothes. Rather, it should be that of the inner self, the inner versus the outer. We have a culture that is obsessed with the outer. It's not just physical appearance, it's all the adornments. What the Scriptures say, if we're going to stand for beauty, it's the beauty of the inward, the unfading beauty, bringing us back to the words of Paul, the beauty that doesn't fade. These are the things that are of great worth in God's sight. And we all know that beauty is fading. As much as our culture wants to try to deny that and spend huge bucks to try to keep that from happening, big bucks, big industry, obsession with youthfulness, obsession with looking young. But the bottom line is, beauty is fading. But there is a beauty that is unfading. As we read that we do not lose heart, our outer self is wasting away. That's true of all of us. No matter how old you are, there is a beauty that's fading. But there is a beauty that's unfading on the inside. As we are being built upon the finished work and foundation of Jesus Christ, the Spirit then empowering and filling us that we might build in partnership with Him a beautiful abode for Christ of gold, silver, and precious stone. Is your life a pointer towards a beauty that's empty? Or are you standing for a beauty that leads to fullness? Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank You that You are a God of radiant, splendid, glorious beauty. And thank You that You, by the work of Your Spirit, are making us into a spiritual house and a fit habitation for Your presence as we are building upon the finished work of Christ. And Lord, we pray that we would build with the gold of faithfulness, that we would use the building materials of silver, of hope in Christ, and that we would labor with the precious stones of loving you, with all of our heart, soul, mind, and strength, and our neighbor as ourselves. And that in the midst of a falling world obsessed with beauty that leads towards emptiness, by your Spirit would you cause your people to stand for a beauty that is unfading. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.